Thank you. Um, good morning, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody who's watching on the webcast. And I'm afraid, Anthony, I'm not going to wave at you. Uh, those of you who were following tweets yesterday will know what that's about. I'm going to talk about uh, the UK and uh, climate researchers and public trust, and it might make for some difficult uh, listening. So, um, but I'm hoping it will lead to uh, a lot of informative discussion at the end. So, I work at the Grantham Research Institute at London School of Economics. It's an institute that mainly studies the economics and social sciences of climate change. I'm not an economist or a social scientist. I look after the um, communications and relationships with policymakers, businesses, essentially all external audiences that are non-academic, and that's my role there. So what I'm going to talk about is essentially, uh, this is the only graph that I'm going to show, but I'm going to talk about the change in the blue graph that occurred right at the top there, which is, uh, this is an annual survey that's carried out for the Department for Transport of uh, a rep representative sample of the British public. And this top line is a question about uh, whether the, um, an individual is at least fairly convinced that climate change is happening. And what you see is between August 2009 and August 2010, you saw a downward uh, dip there. These other lines here are about concerning climate change. And you can see a much more gentle uh, downward drift that sort of start from 2008. Now, in general, concern is probably more to do with the economic crisis. But this, which is about climate change and whether it's happening or not, is, I think, more likely to be about the science itself. It, the other thing to notice is when you ask that question about whether you're at least fairly convinced that climate change is happening, some people interpret that to mean whether uh, it is man-made climate change that is happening. So some people answer no, even if they accept that the climate is changing, but they don't think it's humans. So this is what I'm going to look at. And the answer, I think, is in, you can see from the media coverage that occurred in late 2009, early 2010, around the hacking of the email from the University of East Anglia, which were then put on, on the web. And this is an example of some of the media coverage that occurred at that time. Um, now. I've highlighted at the bottom two main ways in which, or a, a particular theme that the media picked up, and that was around openness, okay? Openness of the perceived lack of openness by the scientists at the University of East Anglia. And that was a persistent theme through the coverage that went on for uh, up to 12 months afterwards. And that's very significant. So I'll come on to explain in a minute. Um, the academic community in uh, its time-honored tradition uh, of responding to crises did not launch a PR offensive, but set up an official inquiry that would take several months to report and then hope that the findings of the inquiry would set the record straight. Well, it's never happened before, and it didn't happen this time. So when the inquiries, uh, whoops. So when the inquiries did uh, report, uh, they were largely reported in a negative way by those who thought that the inquiries had been a whitewash. So it didn't make any difference to the media debate. Then in early 2010, um, we had the additional problem of the IPCC finally admitting that there was a small but significant mistake in one of its reports from 2007, so-called Himalaya Gate. Um, and the important thing to notice here was that this was framed in terms of trust. And it was following on from all the coverage about the emails. So this is the issue, trust. It's not about competence, it's about integrity of the researchers. And that's a very important thing to remember. So the Daily Express should point out that the UK has probably the most competitive newspaper market in the world. We have nine national newspapers, truly national newspapers, that publish every day and uh, great penetration within the uh, public. 
and here's how it manifested itself in the uh, public opinion. This is a survey of the public that was taken about a week after the emails first appeared online in December 2009. Turning to another issue, there have been recent controversies surrounding climate change research at UEA. In general, do you trust climate scientists to tell the truth about global warming or not? And only 41% said yes. So a minority of people said they trust it. Now you could argue, well, this is a biased question. It talks about controversy. So let's go on to a new survey carried out in June 2010. More or less the same question, but didn't mention UEA. To what extent do you agree or disagree with the following statements? We can trust climate scientists to tell the truth about global warming. Only 39% agreed or strongly agree with that statement. So still a minority of the public. Okay. Now you can, of course, with uh, public opinion surveys, fiddle around with the questions and get different results. So this is exactly the same survey, but they asked the trust question in a slightly different way. How much of it all do you trust each of the following groups to tell you the truth about global warming and with climate scientists? And they got trust a lot and trust a little, you get a combined of 56%. But the problem is that in this 39% group, if you ask them the straightforward question, do you trust climate scientists, yes or no, some of those are going to answer no. They're not all going to answer yes. And that's why you get an apparent contradiction with the other result. Move forward to March 2011. To what extent do you agree or disagree with the following statement? We can trust climate scientists to tell the truth about climate change. 38%. So still a minority. So basically, in the two years after ClimateGate emails, you had this persistent low level of trust. Now what we don't have is any information about levels of trust before the emails. And you could argue that climate scientists weren't trusted before climate gate, but I think that's a more difficult sell. And I think given the nature of the media coverage, it's reasonable to expect that it was the controversies around the emails and around the IPCC that caused this uh, damage to trust. An additional factor was the way in which it was exploited, these controversies were exploited by uh, organized skeptics. Um, Nigel Lawson, who is Margaret Thatcher's Chancellor of the Exchequer, is now Britain's leading uh, climate change skeptic. And he launched an organization for skeptics with amazing timing here, three days after the emails appeared online. Amazing timing, amazing timing, with this op-ed in, in the Times in which he drew attention to, uh, for instance, Astonishing, what appears at first blush to have emerged is that the scientists have been manipulating the raw temperature figures to show a relatively rising global warming trend. Now, he never, ever withdrew these allegations, but it was a way in which he exploited these controversies in order to promote his agenda. This is a, an opinion piece that was written by Matt Ridley. He's a science writer. Uh, he's a conservative hereditary peer. He's a great mate of Nigel Lawson, and he was also chairman of Northern Rock up to the time when it was taken over by the British government for catastrophically bad decisions about financial risk. He, however, feels that he is an expert on climate risk, and he get, wrote this article which summed up, unfortunately, the way in which this controversy was viewed by editors in Fleet Street, i.e. that essentially the correspondence, the science and environment correspondence, who didn't really uh, cover very much of the uh, emails initially um, after the first initial coverage. And it was the job of the, of the bloggers who eventually forced it back onto the uh, newspaper's agendas. And a lot of editors feel that their correspondence had gone native to some extent. Here's another example of the impact on the UK media, where it's been even more pronounced than in the public. This graph shows a comparison of the prevalence of um, skeptic voices in newspaper articles. Um, and the comparison is between a period of 2007 and then a period in 2009-10. And you'll see that the light gray is the 2009-10 coverage, which shows a much greater prevalence of skeptic voices. And that was one of the consequences of the controversies. And that is persisting today. Far more skepticism in the British media. And this is summed up in a book by Mark Henderson, who used to be the science editor at the Times. He wrote this very good book, The Geek Manifesto, uh, after he left the Times last year. And uh, he, he gave an account of essentially what happened here. So 
essentially talked about, as a result of the uh, emails, conservative newspapers that had softened skeptical coverage of global warming, such as the Daily Mail, became emboldened and more hostile, and the BBC began to bend over backwards to balance scientific opinion with critics, counterclaims, often using the Global Warming Policy Foundation, Nigel Lawson's group, a new contrarian think tank founded just as the controversy broke. So overall, the, this is a summary of the impacts that resulted. Uh, questions were raised not just about the science, but about the integrity of the researchers, okay? It's not just a question of competence that they were questioning. Climate researchers were perceived to have been slow and reluctant to admit problems, particularly in the case of the IPCC. Science and environment correspondents were accused by their editors of going native. And it wasn't just the reputation of the UEA and IPCC that was under scrutiny, but all of climate research. Some climate researchers essentially um, took the view that this was the UEA and IPCC's problem to deal with and excused themselves from the debate, thinking that it was the, their brands that were under threat. Actually, it was the whole profession that was damaged by this, and it was a terrible miscalculation by many climate researchers to feel that by keeping their head down, they avoided uh, being tarnished by this. Uh, the controversies were exploited by skeptics, and what we now need is a sustained effort by the climate research community to repair the damage to its reputation, and that sustained effort has not arisen yet. So I'm going to talk very quickly uh, about what needs to happen. So just to summarize, for the climate scientists themselves, they face particular problems with the communication. They were attacked as advocates if they called for reductions in greenhouse gases. They were criticized if they did not talk about fully about the uncertainties. And this created a real problem for them when they were being asked about their motives and conduct, because you're generally trained to be objective and neutral. And scientists have to learn public debating skills. I mean, the number of times you see them in public getting rings run around them by lawyers and politicians, I mean, it's just, it's a, a, a real problem. Okay. Transparency is a key issue. I highlighted how some of the coverage had made an issue out of the perceived lack of openness by the researchers at the University of East Anglia. And partly as a result of this, the Royal Society, which is the UK's equivalent of the National Academy of Sciences, carried out a, a full study on uh, science as an open enterprise, looked at the whole general issue of openness in, in um, science. It made the point that at UEA, they had miscalculated the extent to which they needed to be open about their work and about their data, and that it had, and in particular, the way in which they dealt with freedom of information requests. And the number one recommendation that came out of this Royal Society report was about the need to communicate about their models, particularly in areas where openness is in the public interest. And like it or not, climate change research is of public interest and concern, and the expectations on the climate research community, whether it's fair or not, are higher than in most other disciplines. And that is just a fact. You can't change that. You're just going to have to live with it. This is my final slide. So. These are the list of things that I think need to be part of a strategy if the climate research community ever gets around to trying to rebuild trust and confidence from the public in the UK. Engage the public more effectively through direct and indirect means. You cannot just rely on the media to get through to the public. The media distorts, okay? So more town hall meetings, going out and meeting the public. That's actually the best way of rebuilding trust and confidence. You've got to learn more about the information needs of the public. Don't just go and tell them everything you know. Actually find out what it is that they want to know about. More often than not, it's about local impacts. Become more informed about solutions as well as problems. It doesn't really work with the public to just deliver this catastrophic picture of future climate change and say, you'll have to ask somebody else what we should do about it. Uh, Improve the explanation and presentation to the public audience of difficult issues, including uncertainty and risk. And in particular, recognize that skeptics love you talking about uncertainty because they know that that tends to stop people going on to talk about solutions. But if you frame that discussion about uncertainty in terms of risk, i.e. where you talk about the consequences, you get a whole different response from the public and policymakers. So remember, learn to communicate in terms of risk, not just uncertainty. 
Then there's this issue of having to deal with transparency and the general issue of trustworthiness. I mean, that is absolutely crucial, and none of the institutions, the Royal Society or the Royal Meteorological Society, has really got into that yet. Um, got to influence the narratives on climate change that are being promoted by the media. At the moment, they're running away with it. The skeptics are running rings around the climate research community in terms of this. Uh, deal more effectively with the criticisms of mainstream climate research. And then finally, engage policy makers and particularly write those on the right of the political spectrum. Uh, I mean, you can't just opt out. It might be an unpleasant experience talking to policy makers, but it's too important to avoid. Now, these are my solutions for the UK, but I noticed that the work by Tony Lyserovitz showed that there was a nine point drop in trust in climate researchers amongst the American public as a, after climate gate. And so you have, to some extent, the same problem here in the US. And I would su suggest that many of these solutions are things that need to be done as well. Thank you.